Ben Wiedemann is out front. Now, he is in a town that has been partially liberated by Ukrainian soldiers. I do want to warn you that it, what you're going to see is disturbing, but we feel important. The bodies of dead Russian soldiers are scattered around the town of Pisky Radkivsky, killed far from home in what the Kremlin chooses to call a special military operation, but it's a war by any other name. A war into which many more Russians will be thrown now that the so-called partial mobilization has begun. And who may well meet a similar end. This is a bank document found on one of the soldiers. The soldier is from St. Petersburg and he was born on the 30th of September 2001. He died three days before his birthday. The charred remnants of Russian armor are scattered around town. Outgoing artillery pursues an army once considered one of the most powerful on earth. An army that abandoned tanks aplenty, many in working order. Dmitry and his crew are tinkering with one such tank fresh from the battlefield. Minimal. It has minimal breakage, he says. I can turn it on now without any problems. Sure enough, its motor roars to life. When they run away, they lose not only the tanks as Oleksandr, but also the ammunition, and the next day it's all used against them. This tank almost ready to go back into action. Piski Radkivsky lies just north of the Donbas region, which after sham referenda, President Vladimir Putin plans to annex to Russia. Yet few here have fond memories of life under Russia's sway. Stanislav is cutting sheet metal to put over the shattered windows of his sister's home. There was looting in spring, he recalls. They were taking everything. Down the road, Varvara and Raisa are back to what they did throughout the Russian occupation. Just sitting here, says Varvara, they didn't bother us. But Raisa found them annoying. Nazis, Nazis, she says. They always ask, where are the Nazis? The Russians have left or lie dead in the dirt, lives wasted or nothing. Ben, it's impossible to imagine what it was like and to see that. You talk about that boy, I mean, 19 or 20 years old with the bank document. And for you, um, what is it like as you have covered so much of this war to walk through a town like that and see dead bodies of Russian boys all over the place? I mean, it, it was just shocking the number of dead Russians we saw. We counted at least 22 bodies, and we were really in that town only about 50 minutes to an hour, and we really didn't even get a complete look at the situation there. Uh, but just to add some more uh, news for you, uh, this city, Kharkiv, where we are now, uh, just about five hours ago, came under... Russian, rather, missile fire. About five missiles landed, one of them just about 600 yards from where we are now. It took a, a electronic substation out, and the city, much, much of the city, is completely without electricity. In fact, I can see just a couple lights in the background. Perhaps uh, those are from generators. But this just gives you an idea that despite the fact that the Russians are losing ground, in this part of Ukraine, they still have the ability uh, with their long-range missiles to cause serious damage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And important to, to, you know, as they are trying to solidify, uh, you know, whatever control they have over certain occupied areas that they are still trying to attack Kharkiv. Ben Wiedemann, thank you so much for that uh, powerful report. I want to go to now retired Army Major General James Spider Marks. Uh, General, what's your reaction when you see that? Um, obviously, that town that Ben was spent, he said, less than an hour and is extremely close to the line that Putin now is going to define as the line of Russia, even though, of course, it isn't. It was a fake referendum. It wasn't real, and it's not the real border. But that's what he's going to try to say. Um, and that, that they're going through now, and there's literally just, as the Russians retreated, they certainly did not take their dead. It seems to be littered with 
Russian bodies. It, ben wasn't even counting, but at least 22 that he saw just lying there. Yeah, what this really tells you is what we've seen um, the Russians doing for the past seven months. Look, there's no humanity in this fight. Um, there's no sense of leadership, as we've described. There's an absence in terms of any type of a professional ethos. Um, and you, you can imagine the resistance, and we're seeing the pictures of the resistance to this mobilization that President Putin has put in place. Yes. Because it's obvious what, what can possibly happen. That they're going to a fight where the Russian soldier is only fighting for a paycheck and essentially a bucket of lies, and the Ukrainians are fighting for their sovereignty. And the images we've seen are stunning, right? You can see them from, from space, satellite images of 10-mile-long lines at the border. The expe expectation now that those borders could be forcibly closed, uh, sort of a panic of men trying to leave the country. Uh, and you've seen criticism from quarters that we've not ever seen criticism. That's the satellite line there on the Russian-Georgian border uh, that we have up on the screen. Uh, one of a Russian television anchor who has been one of the biggest proponents of everything Putin's done, including advocating for all sorts of nuclear conflagration, uh, actually criticized in, in a bizarre way. Let me play it. The idiots out there who are calling up musicians or individuals with a million illnesses or students, despite the clearly defined exemptions laid out in the decree, not only should they be punished, but they should be the first to be sent to the front lines. If anyone wishes to discredit our Supreme Commander-in-Chief, I'd strongly advise against it. Okay, so he criticizes, and of course, ultimately, the only blame for any of that would be on the ultimate commander in chief. But then says, "Oh, well, you know, don't. I'm not doing that." But it is rare, nonetheless, to hear that, and certainly from him, as I said, a person who has been a big proponent of all sorts of nuclear weapons. How significant is that, if at all? Well, I think it's significant in that what he is saying is the execution of this mobilization, how they're going about it, is completely full of holes. It's not being done very well at all. It, it's apparent that there isn't a sense of what the top line policy is and how that cascades through the various regions and how it needs to be executed. But what he is doing is he's saying, look, everybody, everybody out there is a fool except for Putin. So don't, don't forget that. Putin's in charge. He knows what he's doing. Every, we're surrounded by a bunch of uh, uh, dummies. And this is going to be the result unless we get our act together. And Spider, what about what Dmitry Medvedev said today, which is NATO, Europe, the U.S., they won't do anything if Russia uses nu nukes in Ukraine. And they won't do anything because they don't want to have a big international nuclear war because everybody would die. So basically, we can use nukes in Ukraine. Do you think that's true? Oh, I, I don't think it's true at all. I mean, the, the fact is the benefit, the real strategic value of nukes is in their deterrent effect. When you use a nuke, you've lost its effective value. And I would tell you that if a nuke was used, and I can't get into descriptions, whether that's a tactical nuke, low yield, short range, who cares, or if it's a specific Ukrainian target, or if they do it over the Arctic hole someplace as a demonstration, I would guarantee if that took place, sends a very powerful message, there would be a US-led coalition inserted into this fight led with a coalition of partners from NATO on the ground in, U in Ukraine. They wouldn't cross over into Russia and they would defeat this Russian military in uh, Ukraine in a short amount of time, probably 96 hours. Putin understands that. He has to understand that. 96 hours. Wow. Spider, thank you very much. I appreciate your time, General.